Welcome everybody to the fourth virtual Ithaca innovation lecture or veil as we call it. Um, with this lecture series, we intend to disseminate insights, spread the word about initiatives and spark debate about the ethical and societal aspects of technology. We designed this format such that you can sneak bite-sized introduction and um, an interesting aspect into your busy schedule and meet interesting minds along the way. Um, a quick word about us. Um, we are the Ethical Innovation Hub, a research group that is a joint venture of both the Institute for Electrical Engineering and Medicine and the Institute for the History of Medicine and Science Studies, both uh, located at the University of Lübeck. We do research on how ethical considerations can be used as a driver for innovation in technology development processes. Further, um, I'd like to express my gratitude not only to these two institutions, but also um, because the Veils are supported by the Academy of Humanities and Sciences in Hamburg. So we are gr very grateful for that and um, like to extend our compliments here. Um, we had a range of interesting presentations already. Um, we started off with Wolf Law talking about an interdisciplinary framework to operationalize AI ethics. Um, we had Esther Buchmüller and Beat Vollenwider um, from the Swiss Federal Railways talking about a participatory approach um, to an app design for inclusion. We had Ansgar Kuhne talking about the principles, standards and regulation for trustworthy AI. And today we'll have Thomas Lose Müller talking about sustainability considerations for the digital transformation. That's our program for this term. And for next term, we'll have more interesting talks coming up, but more on that later. Well, now about today's topic. Um, my personal assessment is that discussions about sustainability in the context of the digital transformation and artificial intelligence exists, but it is probably nowhere near the exposition this very important topic really deserves. And from that perspective, I'm very, very happy that today we feature Thomas Lawson Miller talking about exactly that. More about him. Um, uh, Thomas Lawson Miller is an economist and public sector policy advisor. He's a senior fellow at the Hattie School in Berlin, a FIFO policy fellow at the University of Cologne, and a member of several public and private sector advisory councils. He's a senior fellow at the University of Lübeck, and that's where we know him from. He has held various positions as a senior civil servant and is a former state secretary for the German state of Schleswig-Holstein. As cabinet secretary for the prime minister of uh, Schleswig-Holstein, Lawson Müller coordinated governmental affairs, strategic human resource planning, and e-government and IT strategy, among others. Um, now he's also a partner at Ernst & Young Parthenon. So from this broad spectrum of experience, I believe, um, I'm as eager as everybody here to listen to your insights on sustainability considerations for the digital transformation, Thomas. Um, and one brief word um, before we take off, um, if you may have any questions during the presentation, we'd like uh, you to, to remember them and post them. Um, but if you don't mind, we would like first to let the presentation proceed in its entirety and do the Q&A afterwards. Um, this can be then held in both German and English, of course. And now, without further ado, please, Thomas, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Christian, and um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this um, extremely interesting and very interestingly and um, uh, cool named uh, lecture series. I'll um, start my presentation, uh, and while I do that, um, I just wanted to give you a bit of a, um, a kind of background how I did come to this uh, topic and how I was approaching it. I'm now working uh, for um, almost a year with the Federal Ministry of the Environment in Germany, um, uh, looking at exactly this issue. So we helped them um, trying to think through the strategic aspects of, um, of digitalization and digital transformation and um, how uh, you should look at, uh, look at it from an environmental policy perspective. Um, and we encountered quite a few very interesting questions, uh, not only around ethics and values, but also around the mechanics of environmental policy itself. Um, and in fact, um, the mechanics of digital transformation in itself. Um, uh, sometimes these topics are not just linear 
uh, innovative uh, technologies being applied to a certain problem. Um, but uh, to approach the problem, you need to take into account quite a number of complexities of uh, transformation management in general. And um, I am hoping that you can see my screen now. You can, I think. So thanks for the introduction, um, uh, Christian. Um, indeed, I've been looking at uh, many of these transformation problems uh, in digitalization from various aspects as a policymaker, as an advisor, um, also in an academic context, um, and want to talk and structure uh, my little talk into four major topics. The first one is that indeed we have a strategic dilemma uh, at the heart of this question of digital and sustainability. And Christian, you were hinting at it, that it deserves attention and discussion. And the question really is whether digitalization is a curse or a blessing for sustainability. Um, the second one is um, what I already um, uh, mentioned is that we have more it's, uh, deploying technology to solve complex problems like our drive, for example, to combat climate change or achieve more sustainability requires more than simply having the technology in place and applying it. But the, the complexity of changes um, uh, is uh, forcing us to consider this in actually more classical analog terms, for example, in terms of collective action. I'll give a couple of examples of, uh, around this um, based on work that we've done on smart cities. Um, if we would have had this conversation a year ago, um, uh, which is when the first uh, draft of this environmental policy agenda by the ministry uh, was published, um, some of that, uh, the, the discussion might have sounded a bit more abstract, but we had this real life testing right now with Corona, um, with a big push for digitalization, actually also a push in a direction that we wanted to see in terms of delivering more sustainability and achieving more sustainability. Um, and now looking back on the real life experiences, we probably can draw a couple of lessons on what works and what doesn't work. And I want to talk about that a little bit and then finish off with some of the more um, policy specific questions that we are dealing with in this context uh, in terms of how to reframe environmental policy with its instruments of regulation and, and, um, and other um, uh, uh, instruments of policy making um, and how this applies and, and develops at the EU level and also uh, in terms of the discussions we have in Germany. So, but let's start with the strategic dilemma. So, if you look at this discussion around um, digitalization and sustainability, it actually is a discussion with a lot of optimism. Um, uh, here is just a quotation from uh, a, a paper that was put out by Digital Europe, which is a, a big lobby group for digitalization in Brussels. Um, interestingly and tellingly uh, called the narrative sustainability um, uh, uh, and based on a, some, some data crunching, some um, analysis done by Accenture uh, and Gezi, um, they uh, put out this um, uh, calculation that if you deploy digital the right way, yes, you will have an ecological footprint, you will have an increase in energy consumption, uh, you will have an increase in uh, the use of materials. Um, but on the other hand, you have a big impact, positive impact in terms of achieving more sustainability. So what really kind of counts is that you have a net benefit there. And I think actually that this is the right logic to look at um, digital and sustainability. Uh, we know that it has uh, upsides and downsides, and the question really is whether the delta, whether the net benefit um, is positive, and if so, um, then digitalization needs to be a big part of um, our climate change and sustainability agenda. But I'll want to go a bit deeper and look at it um, uh, a bit more specifically, what we need to account of in terms of positive and negative effects. Um, there is a lot of optimism around this um, topic. We've just now looked back um, uh, and uh, did a, a social media analysis. Um, and some of you will have done this yourself. It's just, it's very entertaining. It's probably not 
super academically scientific. But um, if you count the emojis that are associated with this pair of words, digital and sustainability, um, uh, love emojis uh, by far um, are um, connected mostly with those, the, the, the combination of words and joy as well. So uh, in terms of what at least the internet public thinks about this combination, it's, it's one of optimism, it's a blessing for sustainability, the things, the two things go really well together. And this is reflected in, in public opinions as well. Bitcom, the large um, digital uh, lobby group um, uh, in Germany, just um, undertook a couple of surveys, one of um, the general population, um, finding that 87% of um, uh, those in the sample say that the fight against climate change will not be successful without digitalization, which is also the message of the um, uh, federal ministry's agenda. Um, uh, and in an analysis of startups, the latest startup report by Bitcom, nine out of 10 startups believe that digitalization, in fact, will have a very positive impact or can be used to achieve sustainability. Uh, and two thirds of startup founders, in fact, said that their objective is to put out products and solutions um, that foster this goal and go into this direction. So a lot of kind of optimism as something that I think we also see um, uh, within the University of Lübeck, for example, and and really, um, uh, I think you, one should stress, stress that indeed, um, digitalization is a godsend gift. Um, I think we are all pretty clear that without the ability that we get from digitalization in terms of um, its capacities for us to change processes, become more efficient, we will probably not stand a chance anymore to reverse course uh, on climate change and sustainability. Still, um, the story is a little bit more complex. So let's look a little bit more at what the delta is, what the net effect is. Certainly on the, um, on the plus side, we have that digitalization enables us to uh, deliver efficiency. So, and, Example is precision farming. Um, uh, precision farming really enables us to uh, achieve the high, the same amount of output from uh, an acre of land, um, but without uh, actually wasting inputs like uh, diesel or like um, fertilizer or um, uh, herbicides. Um, and you can deploy this in pretty much any technology field, any production field. That efficiency is one of the big. Um, uh, blessings of digitalization. It also, a little bit beyond this, enables us to reorganize social processes and economic processes into a more sustainable setting. Classic example here would be sharing, the sharing economy. So without digitalization, without platforms, without our ability to reduce transaction costs, we wouldn't have been able um, uh, to deploy something like car sharing or tool sharing um, uh, or all the other kind of aspects of the sharing economy. Um, and last but not least, it enables us to have better governance, better policy instruments um, uh, in actually implementing environmental policies. One of the examples that I want to look at in a second is that, um, for example, satellite imagery and the deployment of uh, artificial intelligence and, and pattern recognition um, allow us to monitor the environment precisely um, and actually help also assist in terms of finding um, uh, 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 people who don't do good to the environment by, for example, um, bringing out too much fertilizer or um, uh, anything else. So it, we get these new tools in terms of managing the environment. On the negative side, um, though we have the ecological footprint of digitalization itself, um, digitalization uses a lot of uh, energy. Um, any data transaction um, uh, uses this type of, uh, uses some form of um, uh, electricity. Um, and we have a pretty serious problem around materials where earth and, and other um, uh, difficult to get and, and uh, also environmentally um, a harmful waste of uh, mining those materials, for example. This, I think, so far has been the classic um, calculation. 
Um, what we find, and this is, I think, um, something that has only kind of come to light in the last couple of years because we've deployed so much di uh, digital technology, is that one of the biggest problems are rebound effects. Um, by now, a classic example is that we've been pushing, for example, sharing services, car sharing and scooter sharing and all of these kind of um, uh, devices and tools as part of smart city programs that were trying to reduce mobility, for example, to make um, uh, air quality better. And they were, they were an integral part of this digital push for solutions for sustainability. We found that they actually did not achieve that goal. Um, there are numerous studies from numerous cities by now documenting that, for example, the availability uh, of a, a, a car sharing in fact did not shift people from having their own car towards sharing it uh, and, and driving a shared car, but they reallocated time from foot travel or bicycle travel or using public transport towards using a car. It became the second car. It became the second device allowing people to, even, to, to drive more rather than uh, driving less. The same for Uber uh, uh, in New York. It's a famous study, for example, and uh, uh, for e-scooters and, and all of these kind of things. So rebound effects are uh, pretty big. Um, and it's not only the simple rebound that I just described, but also that digitalization, in fact, enables business models um, that uh, haven't been possible before, but have a negative um, uh, impact. Um, a classic example here in the discussion that you will um, uh, have heard about is, is streaming. Um, so our ability to stream uh, uh, high definition video, for example, has uh, has a new cause or caused new um, in, environmental impact uh, because um, the streaming itself uses data, therefore uses electricity, and this was something that actually just simply wasn't the fact when you simply did it with DVDs or CDs. And we have new governance challenges. Um, uh, it just simply is not as easy anymore to regulate a product um, like we did before if that product changes because AI simply changes what it does over the course of, of a time period. So there are new governance challenges as negative effects. And I think one of the big conclusions and one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that the net effect is not just a simple linear equation, but it, it is a question of the policy, cho policy choices we make. And without policy choices and without be putting the right policies in place, it is not at all certain that the net effect of digitalization will be positive in terms of sustainability. So this was this is just um, the main reference. This is this digital policy agenda for for the environment that has also informed the the German EU presidency in the last half year quite a bit. Um, and it's an interesting um, uh, I think paper to read because it picks up these kind of strategic questions. Um, uh, and it also gives us a, you know, a hint at what the ecological footprint in itself is. And it's not only um, uh, electricity use, um, it's, uh, it's uh, materials, it's this question of kind of enabling, um, uh, enabling uh, business models that might be harmful in terms of su sustainability dimensions. And there's also um, very um, amusing and tricky questions you need to answer. So for example, in streaming, um, you are you have a much better ecological footprint if you are a lover of romance and love films rather than action films, because action movies have this high frequency of changing images um, that the data rates are just much bigger than with slow moving romance movies. Um, so um, so how do you decide? You know suddenly you know um, your rom com uh, uh, body is more sustainable than your action body. Um, and the same is true, for example, in terms of the, the streaming agenda, it makes a huge difference whether you are streaming uh, via fiber optics, uh, which has a lot higher, uh, much, much lower uh, energy uh, consumption than streaming the same material, by, for example, uh, through a, a bad copper line um, or uh, via mobile. So we don't understand the footprint 
landscape completely. We're just at the start at monitoring this, getting data, getting KPIs in terms of actually being able to make good judgments uh, and help people uh, take good judgments in terms of their own behavior. Um, beyond the, the footprint, the, the strategic questions and policy questions we need to ask um, uh, then kind of need to be broken down by different sectors. Um, and we've, we've we looked at four in specific, uh, specifically, um, these don't, um, you know, this is not an exclusive kind of landscape of uh, possible transformation, uh, transformation arena, so they just serve an example. Um, <clears throat> one of the most exciting certainly is that <clears throat> digitalization gives us the tools to um, uh, actually move from move in the industrial production to a circular economy, mainly because it allows us to attach digital twins to products and attach information to products um, uh, that, for example, then um, uh, give you the exact breakdown of materials uh, that can then be brought back into a recycle uh, a mechanism and, and therefore you create circularity. Um, so uh, a digital product pass, a digital twin, um, is a pretty important single um, uh, technology that uh, then allows a whole bigger uh, transformation. In terms of mobility, um, uh, it, it allows us to, um, of course, can have new kind of cars, uh, have autonomous vehicles, uh, have a completely uh, different set of uh, traffic management because we suddenly know which car is where. Um, we have an ability to do just-in-time traffic management, um, allowing us to react to different uh, scenarios and different situations in terms of uh, congestion. Um, and it's just you know, quite an interesting tool uh, to be deployed there. And I'll, I'll, I'll take the mobility example uh, in discussing the collective action problem. In terms of consumption, um, uh, very much like in the industry sphere, you can attach information um, people have more choices, there is more transparency, uh, but also um, we kind of have a new uh, player in town, which is the platform, um, who become private regulators in themselves, and platforms have a lot to do with how consumption will be shaped in the future. The way that um, a, a big online retailer provides you with information about projects and impact the choices that it gives you for consumption will determine what you buy. So there is a kind of new kind of ability also to uh, steer consumption towards on a more sustainable path. And we've already had the example of agriculture. There's lots and lots of um, interesting examples in agriculture. Um, but even there, it's tricky. Um, uh, as I just said, I mean, if you just look at an acre and the, the, the amount of diesel you need to you use to have your tractor going over the field and the amount of fertilizer or herbicides you deploy, that will decrease. But um, it's that doesn't mean that it's already good for biodiversity, for, for example, because it really doesn't matter how much herbicides you you use uh, in terms of if you if you still kill all of the the weeds um, around the crop that you want to um, take. So um, it's not good for bi biodiversity. It might even be worse for biodiversity, but it certainly is good in terms of reducing um, the resources as an input. Um, so the policy from a policy pres uh, prescription, we need to look at the different transformation areas, the different sectors with all of the questions um, that are typical for those sectors. Um, and it's policy choice. Um, either um, we just let digitalization happen, and then it's likely going to have an, a, a, a net negative effect on sustainability, or with the right policy choices and the right ethical framework and, and values attached to it, there is a lot of potential here. Um, and this comes down to policy, it comes down to um, conscious decision making in this space. Now, let me um, have this kind of two um, uh, or three um, ex excursions from this kind of general strategic outline. Um, the first one um, goes back to mobility. And, and you know, and, and many of you are working on this, there is this big promise that we have in the, in the smart city narrative 
that we will be able to use digitalization to manage traffic better, that we will have less accidents, less, less car deaths from car accidents, we'll have less pollution because um, uh, we'll be able to, um, uh, in fact, kind of monitor and steer traffic in a way that is uh, causing less pollution. And we'll also need less space because we can tell cars to move into the city one way uh, and then move out the other way. Um, and this narrative is very powerful and is driving a lot of kind of applications in cities right now. Um, but we did an analysis uh, of what is actually happening. Uh, and the truth is that right now, the development of most of the digital tools in cars, especially towards autonomy, um, is made with a mindset of we are building a car that is able to go from A to B um, on its own. It's fully autonomous. And that's kind of the holy grail of autonomous cars. What we, in fact, don't build is connected cars. So we're not building cars that are talking to each other. We're doing it sometimes within one brand, within one fleet, um, but not we're not building connectivity amongst all of the participants in traffic in a town at a given time. And that means um, that, for example, this promise that you don't have a car accident because this car that comes from the right uh, understands and sees that this car that comes from below is driving with 100 miles per hour um, and stops because of that, because it, it already knows that this is the case. We're not moving there because we don't get this connectivity. We are moving towards, um, in fact, both cars running autonomously and still having a car accident at the corner. Um, and this is a collective action problem. Uh, in fact, incentives for companies are not such a way that they are willing to put their data and their connectivity towards the use of a centralized platform that could coordinate all of these things because you will not make money with that. And this is a typical collective good problem that we know from political and social sciences for 200 years. Um, and let me come to that now. Um, this is a picture um, uh, of in fact, Schleswig-Holstein cows, they live um, uh, on the meadow just across from my house. And in fact, this is the Schleswig, this is the Holsteiner, which is the most famous and most important breed for milk production. Um, I'm not showing you this to talk about agriculture, but in fact that with the, 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 the meadow that we are talking about here, this used to be common land. Um, and we had a classical tragic of the commons problem. It's a limited space. If everybody from the village brings their cows there, this the meadow will disintegrate very quickly. So you need to kind of control who access it to, to preserve the uh, to preserve the meadow. Classic tragic of the commons. Why am I telling you this in the, in the case of mobility? This is a, a two simple graphs that come from. Um, uh, 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 work that Fujitsu did for the Tokyo Olympics that unfortunately don't take place this year. Um, and they were asked, um, how do we steer um, those 8 million people that are coming uh, to Tokyo in a way that they don't cause excessively more traffic? Um, and interestingly enough, um, their supercomputer uh, came out with a very simple answer. It said, look, if you are look, if you are using a simple logic of individual optimization, so you bring everybody the, in the shortest way from A to B, then at one point you will have a traffic jam, and then sure enough, that navigation system will steer you the next shortest route. But in that logic, you'll always have a traffic jam and you'll always have a traffic problem. But if you would instead, from the start, assume that you're using, that you're actually solving a collective action problem and that the optimization is at the collective level, then you would steer some people a further way. So they would not take the shortest way, not even the second or third or fifth or shortest, but maybe the 10th shortest way. But as a collective, 
travel time would be reduced by 40%. And this is what I mean in terms of the analog policy problems that we get with digitalization. Most of the time, and in many of the applications, we are talking about collective action problems. And you need to, and to achieve this promise of digitalization in terms of sustainability, but also other social goods, you need to kind of get this collective action uh, into play. COVID-19, just very briefly, I want to give us um, enough time to, um, uh, to discuss. Um, we had this big push in digitalization. Uh, the sale of telephone headsets went up 900% last April. Uh, we had 100% uh, more video conference traffic. Um, Teams, WebEx, all of these applications had a spike in interest uh, last year. Um, we have a increase in data volume. This is the volume of uh, that is going through um, uh, DITSIX, the, the, the big traffic uh, data traffic hub in Frankfurt. Um, uh, and it, it, in general, kind of data levels have increased. So we had people moved from the analog world to digital to virtual as we do right now. Um, and we had this hope that this means that because people, for example, start working from home office, that this will increase the environmental impact of them being mobile and driving to work. And in fact, the first kind of data that we've seen, this is the Google data, positioning data, uh, we've seen this effect. We had a 30% um, increase of people uh, uh, working from home. But um, looking back a year now, we see that that shift was not sustainable. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see uh, the data that is provided by Apple uh, in terms of the number of requests to the Apple um, routing system for walking, driving, uh, and uh, and transit information in terms of uh, public transport. And we saw a big drop off uh, late la last April in the first lockdown, but then it moved back and in effect overcompensated uh, the lockdown because people were switching from public transport to individual mobility and cars. And only with the, the second lockdown, it's coming down again. And this is also true in terms of when you look at the figures in terms of home office. Even in the in the harshest lockdown last April, people were able to work from home, but that was only up to 30%. 60% of all people still were working at their designated workplaces simply because we could not digitalize them. Uh, just today, there's a new study from the Hans Böckler uh, uh, Stiftung that kind of ha comes up with similar figures, putting the, the, the absolute potential for home office at, at 40%, um, but actually right now we are probably somewhere between 25 and 30% of people that are actually able to use digitalization to, to, to drive less and, and, and have this kind of sustainability impact. Um, and not surprisingly, um, this is easily explained by the type of jobs we are talking about. It's people like us that earn their money with talking um, uh, that are, you know, relatively high educational standard and with relatively high income levels. So again, um, despite all of the hopes, um, uh, the potential for digitalization without additional analog policy that forces this behavior change uh, is probably not just going to do it. It's not so easy in terms of achieving our goals. Just uh, two um, uh, examples in terms of environmental policy and, and the tricky questions we need to deal with there. Um, this is a picture of, um, of a farm uh, here in, in Schleswig-Holstein. This is actually just a, a screenshot from uh, Google Maps. Um, and those of you who are a little bit into this can see that you can see at least, at least four suspicious events in terms of um, uh, their compliance with environmental regulations. Um, the, the round uh, thing in the middle next to the two barns uh, is their sewage. It's, it's where they collect all of the um, uh, 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 cow dung. Um, that's probably too small for the likely number of cows under the roof, something that you could calculate. You see that the color of those little two lanes, two lakes uh, on the left, is probably a little too green for the time of the year. Uh, you see 
that um, on the right hand side there is an there's an open storage uh, facility for food which is only allowed temporarily and it's pretty big and you would probably also see that um, the, the bush rows the knicks uh, that we are famous for in Schleswig-Holstein haven't been cut down as they're supposed to be every 10 to 15 years so and this is just public data so i can look at it and probably kind of have these kind of four or five observations so this illustrates how powerful satellite imagery uh, and, and and pattern recognition could be in terms of enforcing compliant compliance with environmental laws which is quite exciting but at the same time we need to have a conversation about the big brother state here and we have similar discussions in terms of traffic control uh, and, and everything else so there's new tools and powers for the states um, but we need to kind of discuss how we deploy these um, uh, and, and how intensely we want to kind of foster this kind of compliance regime. And the last point that goes back also to some of the conversations we had um, uh, in the last uh, sessions, um, we are now at a time where we will have major new regulation coming for platforms, digital markets, and AI. Uh, and one of the big policy questions is how do we anchor sustainability in these kind of regulatory ag agendas? Much of the discussion on AI, as you've heard last time, is not centered around sustainability, but around civil rights, um, uh, civil liberties, um, and, and, and a human rights agenda. Um, but you have sustainability impacts here as well. One of the most um, interesting is that a big part of how we regulate products, which is a pretty important bit of environmental policy, is focused on allowing a product to go to market at at one point at the start and then we know the product is going to be the same if it would change it would have to come back for a re-registration and by that we enforce standards in terms of energy efficiency in terms of um, poisonous uh, materials uh, and so on but this completely changes with ai being built into products the, the product that we that we regulate today and allow to the market today might not be the product in a year's time once a self-learning mechanism has changed the logic of this product and it does different things so again this is a complex regulatory agenda we are only at the start in terms of looking at this um, and i hope i could give you some hints and examples with a rather kind of broad brush of this agenda and sensitize you for some of the questions that lie ahead in terms of digital transformation. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and I'm really looking forward to the discussion.